I'm going to be talking about geopolitics. That's way above my pay grade. Um, actually, this uh, keynote was pretty last minute uh, put together. The reason is that the person who is going to speak here, he called in sick over the weekend, and so the organizers had to get together and figure out like who, who are we going to ask to to speak at this slot. And somebody asked, like, shall we like pick Do Kwan? Like. No, he's like kind of hard to pin down lately. And then uh, somebody else said, what if we asked Joe Lubin? And they're like, no, he's hard to find. There's a rumor going around that Vitalik is about to launch The Purge. What about this Belgian guy? Like, he's badgering us. Should we like ask him? Like, well, Belgians, like, don't they always like get melancholic and talk about the past and stuff? All right, let's give him a try. So that's the story of how I ended up here, um, verbatim. So, so I want to talk about uncertainty today and, uh, and about finding hope. Um, the world really is changing very, very quickly lately. I think we all noticed that. There are people who wonder, like, are we seeing a repeat of the 1970s or even the 1920s? with like runaway inflation. Other people are worried about 1930s redux, like demagoguery and populism, like is that gonna happen again? And then there's people who um, think about a uh, continuation of the 2000s, like are we gonna see more bubbles pop? And I mean, you can make that argument, like maybe the real estate bubble is popping. For sure, global bond markets are crashing, like we're down 30% year over year, so that's happening. And these are markets that are way bigger than the stock markets. So <clears throat> for sure, there is a lot of um, uncertainty, and it's, it's, it's unsettling. And to be honest, like I'm frightened at times. Like This is scary stuff, uh, the stuff we're reading in the news. And so to me, the challenge is like, how do I, you know, kind of process this information without falling into extremes. I think one extreme is to kind of have this anxious paralysis where you just doom scrolling and you keep refreshing the news and try to read everything. And I think that's kind of the equivalent of like staring into the abyss so much that you like fall into it, uh, which I think is not, not very healthy. And then the other extreme is to like, go about your life kind of with blinders on and just try to focus on what's right ahead of you and put food on the table and, um, and just get on with it and just have this attitude of like, oh, nobody ever knows what's going to happen. There's no way to predict. Uh, and I think the risk there is that, well, you're blind and so you could literally stumble into the abyss. All of a sudden your house is being repossessed or you can't access the money in your bank account or things like that. So, so, so how do you find the middle ground, like the Aristotelian mean? Like how do you, you know, move forward uh, in this uncertain world is, is something that I, I think about quite regularly. And I find in general that it, it, it really helps to, to have a direction that I'm drawn towards, to walk towards something that I'm, you know, excited about or feel good about rather than focusing on all this, um, this uh, negative side of the uncertainty. And so that you know, brings up the question, like, well, what is it? Like, what are the things that bring me comfort? Like, I'm not going to be able to talk for all of you, just kind of what, what works for me. Um, and what I found is that to give me a sense of grounding, it helps for me to think back of um, my ancestry, basically, going back generations and uh, not even just a few, but like way, way back. Like it's, it's just a biological fact that 
every single one of my ancestors, I don't know about your ancestors, but every single one of my ancestors, <laughs> um, they, they survived crazy stuff. Like literally, they survived the Ice Age. Maybe some of them lived on like Dogerland and that sunk into the North Sea and then they had to go to the continent. And then later, they survived the Black Death, right? The plague and then all these wars. And so somehow, you know, all that stuff is, is in our DNA and, um, and that, to me, gives me comfort. Maybe it's a low bar, like, oh, they survived into early adulthood. But, you know, you got to start somewhere. And then, you know, thinking back more recently, like, I remember having conversations with my, my grandma about the, the, the Second World War, and she was telling me how there weren't any rubber tires to put on the bicycles, and so you had to, like, put rope around the valken, I forget the English word, and then you would use your bike and... and go in the countryside and try to buy some, some eggs and milk from the, from the farm, which was illegal, and you had to be careful to try to not run into uh, German soldiers. And then there's also family lore about the First World War, which by many accounts was even worse from an occupied point of view. Uh, and so all that stuff, like all this incredible hardship and this crippling uncertainty, like that is part of my family, and I'm sure of many of your families. And so in a way, there is this, um, there is this kind of like cultural blueprint that comes with that, you know. Uh, if I think about where I'm from in particular, Flanders, like people are more like reserved and they take a long time to warm up. And, um, and, and, and so those things are often things that I was confused about growing up. But now, like especially seeing the news, what's going on in Ukraine and just what it's like to live it. And, I, and I'm in touch with a few people there. It's just like it, there's a lot of value in these things. And so that gives me comfort. And um, another perspective that for me has been helpful is um, and, and that just doesn't just give me like a feeling of stability, but actually makes me feel grateful to be like alive right now instead of any other era it's this idea that um you know rather than thinking about uncertainty as something that can only produce negative things right uh like the 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 screws of the machine are loose and it's rattling like oh no that's bad well yeah but at the same time it means there's an opportunity to recalibrate things to redefine things maybe even uh, re- re-establish new institutions and new ways of doing things. And um, a period in which this happened in particular, like right here in the Netherlands and also in Flanders, was the, the Protestant Reformation. And I, I'm sure some of you uh, remember I, I wrote about this a few years ago, suggesting that we are now living uh, the Bitcoin Reformation, that actually th- we have a similar um, kind of dynamic going on. And so it's tempting to look back um, at that time period of the Reformation with a kind of a romantic feeling. Because you do feel like there's this enormous pride pride that comes off of these incredible paintings, like a real celebration of individuals, celebration of community and achievement uh, in a way that just didn't happen, you know, in the the decades and in the centuries before. And... um, so, so all that we see and we, we can kind of sense that that's special. And at the same time, we can celebrate all the innovation that happened back then. There was navigational tools that allowed people to not only travel far, but also come back, right? And, and thus explore new continents. All that was, was prepared back then. There was tremendous innovation in the financial sphere, like the, the, the budding insurance industry. There was the Bank of Amsterdam, which was famous all around Europe, um, just incredible innovation. Um, and, so, and so we feel the positive stuff about them, but it's easy to forget that all of this happened in a context of existential threat. Like the 80 years war happened right then. And the, the foe was not just some neighboring country. It was the largest empire on the face of the planet. The Spanish empire was the most powerful uh, nation at the time. And they sent... 140,000 soldiers marching towards the Netherlands to, to um, submit the whole country and to obviously, you know, execute the, the people that were most outspoken and things like that. Um, 
And so I think that some of the brilliance that happened during that time uh, of the Reformation, things that we celebrate to this day, happened because of this pressure that people were under and because that you had to do things now. Like you, there was no use in postponing things. There was no use in planning 20 years ahead. Like maybe you would do that, but then maybe you would think about the next generation or something like that. So, um, so that to me is, is very, very comforting. Like if I think about, you know, if I worry about the uncertainty and the, the, the hardship and, you know, what might happen and what is the right thing to do, uh, I think about like, would I really want to live in another era? And honestly, no. Uh, I think there is part of the, the, the brilliance that's here in this room, that's in the Bitcoin space, are diamonds that are being formed under the pressure of all that is going awry in society. People sense that we need to do things differently or we want to try and contribute in a positive way. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the, the part about what, what gives me hope um, in, in this uncertain time. And there is one, one final thing I want to share with you. And it's just kind of very briefly my perspective on, on, on what the value is of, of being involved in Bitcoin. Um, there's, a, there's a mentor that I had uh, back when I was living in Belgium. And uh, his name is Frank van Dun. He was, uh, he's now retired. He was a professor of uh, philosophy of law. He taught in Ghent. He also taught in uh, Maastricht. And... Um, he developed a theory of um, law that, that um, explained the origins of conflict and how you can resolve conflict and, 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 uh, in, in the political sense, but it's, it's a very universal theory. And I think this is so valuable because I think at our core, all of us, like even people that we consider deplorable, uh, have on a level are motivated to reduce conflict. Either reduce conflict within yourself, reduce conflict in, with the people around you, reduce conflict in society. So it's such a universal desire. And so thinking about these four universal solutions, they're, they, they're split in half. There's two of them that are political solutions. Two of them are economic solutions that come from market activity. And so the political solutions are um, consensus, and unity. And they are very tricky to achieve. You know, like consensus, the idea of democracy, let's just agree to disagree and do things a certain way. Uh, unity is more like calling on people's sense of identity, like we're all part of this bigger thing and maybe like nationalism is part of that. And so like, like I said, that's geopolitics, like that's above my pay grade. Um, Definitely not my expertise. But then on the market side, there's two more solutions to conflict. And one of them is um, the creation of abundance. Because it makes sense, right? If there's two kids who are fighting over who's going to eat the pancake, well, if we have 10 pancakes, then there is no conflict. So, so creating abundance is really powerful, but we're living in a... In a, in a uh, um, an era where that is not really available. Like actually, society has been living above its means now for decades because of the, the fiat economy that incentivizes short-term behavior. People's savings have been depleted. So we can't really lean on that. Like the 1960s, just, it just ain't happening, right? Um, and so what is, the, what is the last option? The last option is called um, restriction of access. I know that sounds abstract, but it's basically... Um, it, it, it's that thing that's um, that, it's that what we mean when we talk about good fences make good neighbors. You know that expression? Good fences make good neighbors? Well, it basically means that if we have a clean way to separate mine and thine, like what is my property and what is yours, then that allows for peace, right? And so in my view, what Bitcoin does, what we are all working on, is creating better fences. And I know that sounds maybe kind of silly or, or like simple, but in my view in this world where everything is over-engineered and where's jargon everywhere and it's, it's just, you know, so confusing, 
uh, I think it's, it's an enormously valuable thing to be contributing to. In a world of uncertainty, if you're building better fences, you're doing a damn good job. So I'm very proud to be even just a little part of this community. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you have a great day. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Magazine uh, Analyst Desk, brought to you by BitGo. We are live at Bitcoin Amsterdam, and I am joined by my colleague CK, as well as George McHale. We just heard an awesome conversation just about the importance of hope, about you know not getting too caught up in everything going on over in Clown World. I'd love your guys' thoughts. Like, what what is the noise? What is the signal? What are you guys really just not catering to as far as fear mongering? So, I mean, I have to say that. We live in a world right now that is absolutely falling apart. Trust is falling apart. Tradition is falling apart. The establishments that we're supposed to trust are falling apart. And there has never been more dissatisfaction with how things are going. There's never been more nihilism, at least in recent history. And Bitcoin is hope. Having a system where you don't have to trust, having a system where you know that is, it creates hope. It, it, it gives you a foundation to build off of. And I think it, it breeds optimism in this community. And if you are here at Amsterdam, if you've been to any Bitcoin conference, you can see it. You can feel it. It's intoxicating. And I have to give a, a, a toast out to tour. Absolutely fantastic session. The man knows his history. And it is so fascinating to see the ebbs and tides are the ebbs and flows of history and humanity and how we go from despair to hope and back. And I think Bitcoin is, is like this new wave of hope that is going to usher in a new era that is unlike the previous because this technology is so pure and sound. Definitely. I mean, I think it's an underrated point. You know, like if you're a Bitcoiner, it really does start to consume everything about your reality because you start understanding how much of a tool this is and how uh, powerful it can be to, to transform society. And really, without Bitcoin, you start to lose hope. I can't even imagine a world where Bitcoin didn't exist. You would start looking at some of these problems, and you would be like, well, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to begin to even address some of the stuff that's coming at us? And as the walls continue to close in on, on privacy, on freedom, on all these things that we value and that we kind of take for granted, I mean, thank God for Bitcoin uh, that it exists and that we actually have this thing that can actually help us climb out of hey, the societal. For you for I know, sorry. I've been write it. that book, <laughs> low key shill. Ax but absolutely, shill, but absolutely. Great meme. Uh, can you imagine going through 2020 and 2021 without Bitcoin? Like, no, no wonder everyone's such a nutcase. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Well, I want to highlight, too, one thing the tour was talking about was just this rise of populism, which you actually explored with your co host, Ansel Linder on FedWatch, which is on this channel every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. If you want to catch those conversations, be sure to subscribe. But I'd love, CK, if you could just expand on what you guys talked about, about populism seems to be the growing wave, not just in little pockets, but all over the world now. Well, I, I think that it's attached to this breakdown of global trust. So that is, you know, it, it's obvious. You don't have to be a Bitcoiner to see it. It is the story of the last two years is we've gone from a world with maximum trust, with maximum collaboration. Now, all of a sudden, no one is doing that. So what does the populace have to do? The populace looks internally and it stops and, and, it, and it starts to focus on itself. And that's called populism. Absolutely. I mean, George, you even just recently went through this where you just felt like where you were living didn't actually offer the things that you and your family needed. Mm -hmm. So you picked up and went somewhere else that actually had and offered the things your family wants and needs. Yeah. Do you want to talk and share a little bit about just that exploration? Sure, yeah. I mean, and it's not just even the move. I mean, the, obviously Bitcoin gives us that mobility where we can have that freedom to go wherever we need to go and take our asset with us. But I mean, like even just look around here, I don't know if we can get a shot of, of this crowd, but just like the excitement and the energy, anytime you get around Bitcoiners, you feel this sense of hope and you feel the sense of like things are beginning to change. And so come out to Bitcoin conferences, attend your local meetup, make friends with other Bitcoiners because we are changing the world. There's absolutely hope at the end of this tunnel. Guys, if you are not already, please make sure you subscribe and you like down below. We're going to be back after this next talk.